We are coming to the start of 1996 with the January issue of Nintendo Power um, number 80. The first issue post the Space World Exo. There's a, some big stuff this issue and some not so big stuff, so let's get started. This issue's cover is a big gatefold cover with the outside reaching featuring the acronym, acronym NU, which I think was meant to be the acronym for the Ultra 64, where the inside shows the console and a bunch of screenshots of games. The letters column for this issue has been increased to three pages, and this issue has a whole bunch more game pitches. So we're using some older stuff. However, all this comes at a cost to the power charts. It's been dropped down to one page, and we've lost the Hall of Fame inductees. However, what we get instead is some poor results for some Japanese import games, including a few that never got a U.S. release on the Super Nintendo, like Super Nintendo Picross, which is, as of this recording, actually just now available on Nintendo Switch Online, and Secret of Mana 3, and a Super Robot Wars game with the title translated as Super Robot World. Well, we now have Earthworm Jim 2, with maps of several early stages of the game, along with notes on new game mechanics and bonus stages. Earthworm Jim 2 plays a lot like the first game did. The controls are a little better, and on the one hand, the level designs hold off on stuff that causes your character to move around somewhat out of your control, like the rubber-bouncing tires in the first level. That said, it replaces that by aggravating one problem from the first game that was a minor problem there, but is much worse here misuse of foreground and background objects. In the first Earthworm Gym, we'd occasionally get bits where they'd have a background layer become a foreground layer, so you had Jim moving behind the background in a tunnel or something like that. But otherwise, it was not to a degree where I had any issues telling where on the level were places that I could stand and places that I couldn't. This game is quite the opposite. There are... It is... A major problem here where I have difficulty looking at the game level environments and just determining, oh, this is a platform, this is purely cosmetic. And it's frustrating. And it's not helped by the fact that there are elements in level designs where platforms will shift from hard surfaces that Jim can stand on to surfaces that he'll pass through with very little rhyme or reason. Even similar or, or looking level objects on the same background or foreground plane will vary as to whether you can stand on them. It's tremendously frustrating and it makes the first level in particular a real pain to play. This really makes for a good example as to why the retro-inspired platformers that have been coming out, basically since the rise of the indie scene, have, once they've fared the best, have used a style that was taken from games earlier in this console generation still using this a 16-bit aesthetic, but using one that fits more with like something like, oh, uh, Super Contra, or Act Razor, or that sort of thing. We have the big coming out for the N64 at Space World. We get some bullet points specifically written with the intent of coaching the reader on how to be a better console warrior in your arguments at the schoolyard, or possibly on internet news groups, or letters columns in other magazines, which is actually kind of gross. The article also hypes the N64DD, which never came out here in the US. I will have a link in the show notes to a episode of Gaming Historian on the topic. We also have an interview with Takeshi Tezuka and Shigeru Miyamoto, with the focus being on Mario 64, along with some discussion of the controller and the hardware. There's also a rundown of all the launch titles planned for Nintendo 64, starting with Mario 64 along with Shadows of the Empire. We also get some very early shots of Ocarina of Time, which at the moment is just called Legend of Zelda 64. Our next featured game of the issue is Revolution X, a light gun game featuring Aerosmith that was a staple of most of the arcades I encountered in the 90s through the 2000s, along with Terminator 2, the arcade game. Most of these had some form of, like, fixed lockdown light gun on the console, sort of like with um, Operation Wolf. And so, possibly also that fixed light gun may have also been controlling when you tilted it, and rather than doing a light gun functionality, it could have been a joystick as well. So, this is actually potentially a game that works really well with 
use for controller as opposed to some other light gun titles. We get a complete map of the game, including where all the members of the band are hidden, which is nice to know, because I was never able to find any of them in the arcade version. So, having played a bunch of the arcade version of this game back in the day, in fact, even having beaten it, though, again, not finding the band members, I can safely say that this isn't a great port. The loops of Aerosmith music are fairly repetitive, and the digitization of the characters is much more limited. This is best demonstrated by the cutscene at the first level, where the members of Aerosmith are kidnapped by the NON at the start of the game. Now, in the arcade version, the band is, Aerosmith is playing on stage, and a bunch of non-goons come out and herd the members of the band off at gunpoint, with each member of the band having a line spoken in protest. In the Super Nintendo version, the characters just drop off screen like you'd knocked over a cardboard standee. Frankly, I'd recommend that you'd be better off just playing this in game and uh, in, in MAME and using a mouse to simulate a light gun. Next up is Mutant Chronicles Doom Troopers, a video game based on the Swedish tabletop RPG and miniatures game set in the same universe as Mutant and the more recent tabletop RPG Mutant N Year Zero. There are maps of several levels of the game up to the penultimate level. So if it wasn't clear from the look and feel of the game, Mutant Chronicles is the Mutant Universe's answer to Warhammer 40k, except confined to the solar system instead of having interstellar travel. The game puts you as a pair of Doom Troopers, who are basically space marines, sent to go on various missions throughout the solar system. It's also tremendously difficult. Your character is fairly squishy, and unlike, say, Contra, you have to keep track of your ammo, which is somewhat scarce, and then on top of that, some of the item placement is just absolute garbage. You have weapons placed over bottomless pits, and enemy characters standing on waterfalls that player characters can't walk on. Now, there is possibility that maybe this is like some sort of emulation uh, content, uh, not content, but uh, copy protection thing. If so, that... I mean, considering this may also get set off by clone consoles, possibly, um... That's even more disincentive for me to... Uh, for me to pick up the game. So, well, I was interested. To, I, I was interested to play this. I was like legitimately interested, just because I like playing games, video games based in tabletop universes, even if it's like a weird reinterpretation like this one. But this is frankly pretty crap, and I can't recommend. It. Getting into our epic center section, the. Second of the Breath of Fire games has come out, and apparently there's enough of a translation problem that Nintendo Power is calling attention to it in the article, instead of just hoping that you didn't notice. There are notes on each of the party members and their abilities. Breath of Fire 2 plays a lot like the first game, which is fine. The narrative is conveyed a little more a little differently than it was in earlier games, with some more involved cutscenes and a little more graphical complexity. I don't have a problem with this. Um, in fact, I like the, the shift in presentation. That said, I ran into a couple of the translation issues of the Nintendo Power brought up very early in the game. And if you want to get more into these hiccups, I recommend checking out the article from Legends of Localization about those issues. There will be a link in the show notes. Also, if you're planning on picking up a physical copy of this game for use with the Retron 5 or Mega, I would recommend, under the circumstances, using one of the free translation patches that have been put out by the, by the community to fix the numerous issues with the game's narrative. The Secret of Evermore Guide still continues. Again, I've already reviewed this game. I'm not going to cover it too much further. In the Epic Center News column, which is pushed more to the back of the section, Nintendo Power's editorial staff is organizing a letter-writing campaign to get Enix to release Tactics Ogre and some of their other RPGs in the U.S. Now, this doesn't necessarily get them in Super Nintendo release, but this does build up name recognition for the re-releases later, like Tactics Ogre getting a U.S. release on the PlayStation. So, hey, I, I, I appreciate this. Well, we haven't had the Nestor Awards yet, but... Since we're starting out uh, 1996, we do have Nintendo Power Staff's own awards for the top games the past year. Now, the top three all first-party titles, and while the games are good, it still feels slightly sketchy, at least on the Super Nintendo side. 
The Game Boy ranking is otherwise okay, though I will admit that I would have ranked Picross higher. There are a couple of sports games this issue, with Ken Griffey Jr.'s winning run for the Super Nintendo being the first of these, and the game being put out by Rare using pre-rendered CG characters and backgrounds, like with the Donkey Kong Country game. So I haven't covered a baseball game for a while, so let's, let's give this one a shot. Unfortunately, Ken Griffey Jr.'s winning run shows the issues that baseball games have had throughout the 8-bit and 16-bit console generation, and on handhelds as well. Solid, rock-solid pitching and batting, but really rough fielding for the player, but while the computer fields spectacularly. I wanted to give this game a try, partially because of the graphic overhaul the coverage of the game was touting, but also because I really wanted to see how baseball games had changed as we reached the end of this console generation. Football games had always generally been solid. Basketball games had some issues related to the lack of a solid ability to depict depth of field, since everything is 2D strikes, but baseball is one of the things that could have been great, but never was. I had a hope that this time, at the changing of the console generations, a second party developer who knows the hardware just as well as the top teams of Nintendo itself does could have put out a better game, and I was greatly disappointed. There's notes in a bunch of upcoming Disney Interactive titles. Some of these will have come out, or rather will come out, to not skip the timeline too much, like Maui Mallard or Toy Story. Others, like Pocahontas and Gargoyles, never get a Super Nintendo release, but do come out on the Sega Genesis. Next, we have Scooby-Doo Mystery, which I remember being a point-and-click adventure game based on the cartoons, and we have maps of some of the early areas of the game. Well, um, so my memory was mixing this up with the Genesis version. The Genesis version was the one that had the point-and-click style interface, and that's the one where I remembered playing it and thinking, yeah, this, this, this is a solid thematic fit with the concept of the cartoon. Instead, the Super Nintendo version, which is what we have here, is a hybrid adventure game and platformer, which is where the game falls flat. You see, ultimately, <laughs> when you like look at it critically, more critically than some people probably have, Scooby-Doo is a series about exploration and investigation where the ultimate focus of each episode is solving a mystery with the process of that investigation also setting up a series of gags. Both dialogue, sight gags, and slapsticks. There are action sequences and chase sequences in each episode, yes, but those serve as either scene transitions, setups for more elaborate jokes, and in the better episodes, both. To put it this way, another way, Scooby-Doo, you don't, alright, I don't want to play out a Scooby-Doo hallway scene. I enjoy watching one. I think they're fun to, but I think they're fun to watch. But progression in the game shouldn't require me to successfully play one out. Our second sports game of the issue is PGA Tour 96, with diagrams and notes for six full golf courses. PGA Tour 96, at least for the Super Nintendo, is a game with some very real problems, and the list starts right at the get-go with the wind. Long story short, wind doesn't work this way. In the game, you'll begin lined up for a shot, and then the wind will veer rapidly from left to right across the course, going 15 to 17 miles per hour each way. And I don't mean like like a headwind that will kind of veer a little bit to the left or right. I'm talking like crosswise. Like the wind will be gusting all of a sudden, um, blowing the ball to the left, and then just as rapidly blowing the ball at the exact same speed to the right within a matter of seconds back and forth, back and forth. That's not how wind normally works. It will generally stick in the direction, though the speed will certainly vary over time. It may go to their direction based on a variety of factors and geog geography and other, and other such stuff, but it does not, like, switch rapidly back and forth like somebody playing with a light switch. And indeed, when it comes to golf, this is a key part of what's involved with lining up your shot. 
figure out what direction the wind is coming from, how fast it's going, and how that will impact the movement of the ball in the air. However, when the wind is swinging so dramatically, it makes it tremendously hard to line up a shot. Now, yes, the game will lock in the wind speed and direction at the moment you start your swing, but it's still really darn frustrating because now you got to sit and wait until you like, got to figure out what your shot's going to be. You're going to sit and wait until the wind gets lined up in the right direction for you and then hope that you press the button to start the uh, swing animation and all of that before er, before the wind changes again. This is also aggravated by the game hooking or slicing too far too aggressively. I've had repeated shots where I've strictly had a headwind, been a few pixels off from a square shot on the return, and ended up deep in the rough, often behind some trees. Yes, there's some degree of hook or slice if you don't be a per get a perfect shot. That that's what you should get with a golf game, but there should also be some margin for error. And the level of hook or slice shouldn't be spectacularly penalized to the point where I lose where like, I where, long story short, I'm certain to get, like, multiple bogeys on a hole just because of how far deep in the weeds, literally, the ball has gone. It is amazingly frustrating. If I want to go lose golf balls on the in the bushes, I can do that on my own in real life, thank you very much. I have an old beat-up set of clubs I got from a thrift store from a long time ago. I could afford to go pay it for a tea time and just send golf balls hurtling off into the void due to my own incompetence in real life. Now again, this could be some degree of copy protection. At this point in the lifespan of... The of the Super Nintendo, we have started getting varying degrees of cartridge copy devices letting you copy your uh, Super Nintendo games, the floppy discats and all this, that, and the other thing. People using them to dump ROMs um, from cartridges to put them up on the very early emulation sites. I completely understand that that is, pro that this, some of this may be a, a awkward attempt at copy protection because of that, and this causing potential problems for preservation now. But again, this then leads to the question of, is this going to cause problems for you if you are not playing this game on original hardware or even on a, um, a, uh, something like the, um, analog, uh, super NT. And that is a good question. I don't know. Um, this is, could definitely, if this is a copy protection mechanism, could cause some, will cause some problems on Retron 5 or on a Polymega when that launches. As it is, I am playing this on a fairly cutting, fairly current emulator. So, as far as for the gameplay capture, so presumably the emulation architects would have been able to have plenty of time to try and adjust to deal with this. So, I don't know. In either case, there's a PS1 version out there. Get that instead. Next, we have the classified information column. And this has been completely redesigned, both in terms of visual style and in terms of the level of presentation, with most games only getting one trick per game, with the exception of, final, of uh, Mortal Kombat 3. I'm not a fan of the change here. I, I like the dossier file style from before. Well, Final Fight ushered in the start of the 16-bit era, at least for the Super Nintendo, with the original game, and it is seeing it out with Final Fight 3. No Cody this time, with the roster instead made up of Guy, Hagar, Lewis, and Dean. We have maps for the first six stages. The 16-bit console generation was very much about the rise of four genres. Brawlers, fighting games, shoot-'em-ups, and JRPGs. Of those, the last three made it to the 32-bit generation, and yes, I'm counting the N64 as a 32-bit console, without too many issues. They may have changed formats to varying degrees, the fighting games moving to 3 d blink based characters following in the wake of Virtua Fighter and uh, Tekken. 
and shooters give you the opportunity to throw a lot more sprites and bullets on screen at any one time. But the genre of brawlers didn't really fare that well in the generation of the PlayStation 1, Saturday 164. Arguably, not really until getting reinvented as the character action genre on the generation of the PlayStation 2. Now we get games like Fighting Force, but the places where that game and its like stumble serve as a really strong example of why that genre fell into problems in that, in that mechanism. Thus, Final Fight 3 kind of feels like the last hurrah for the classic brawler. Final Fight ushered in the Super Nintendo, and while we're certainly getting more Super Nintendo games after this point, possibly even some more brawlers, this feels like Final Fight seeing the console out for one last ride. Honestly, the game just works, but the controls were solid to begin with, and they're still solid now. For all, there are some additional special moves that you can use with Street Fighter-style controller motions. A lot of the tactics that worked on the first two games still work here. It's a fine final chapter to the Final Fight series, at least until we get Final Fight Streetwise on the PlayStation 2. We have a couple more Virtual Boy games. Um, well, a more Virtual Boy game with some general gameplay notes for Jack Brothers. We start off our Game Boy games with Tetris Blast. This is an odd variant of Tetris with the addition of bomb pieces. So the problem with Tetris Blast is it is a Tetris game which skews with the Tetris formula just a little bit too much. First off, lines don't clear unless they have bombs in them. Second off, not all pieces have sets of four some of which have two or three blocks in them, which just screws with the formula in terms of how you're structuring your drops and that sort of thing. And also, I mean, the, the whole thing with Tetris is the prefix refers to four, not three, not two, four. It's not dutris, not treatris, tritris. I mean, it's okay. It just doesn't feel quite like Tetris. I just recommend, you know, sticking with a regular Tetris game. And by regular, I don't mean, like, just bland or blah NES original Game Boy Tetris. Tetris Effect is great. Tetris 99 is great. Just this particular variant, not so much. And then the other two Game Boy games we're covering this issue we're not actually reviewing for reasons of them not necessarily being available or being really bad. First is the gate is the getaway high speed two a Game Boy adaptation of a Williams pinball table by Dan Toast Toasty Borden. However, near they can tell, this game was never formally released, and if there's a prototype out there, it was never dumped, which is a bummer. Though the table has been emulated on other platforms, and like Williams are pinball collections and pinball hall of fame and that sort of thing, so it's probably better off playing it that way in an actual more serious recreation of the pinball table. Next up is Big Hurt Baseball, a Game Boy port of the Super Nintendo baseball game. Considering how the Ken Griffey Jr. game turned out earlier this issue on a Super Nintendo that's meant to be played on a big television screen, or at least a television screen with a wider field of view, I'm going to cut my losses and say we can skip this one. In Counselor's Corner, we have a bunch of tips for Chrono Trigger, and the presentation here has also been slightly tweaked, not as heavily as the classified information column, but noticeable. In the now playing column, they also ran of a couple fishing games and a spawn. I mean, we're we're in the mid to late nineties now, so yeah, that spawn is to be expected. And finally, in Pack Watch, we have Mega Man X three coming up. My pick for this issue would be Final Fight three if it didn't cost so goddamn much for a loose copy. Breath of Fire 2 is currently available on Switch Online, though that is the original version with all the translation issues that come with it. That said, if you have a Retron 5 or are going to pick up a Polymega with the uh, um, Super Nintendo cartridge slot, you may consider importing the Super Famicom version instead, as this game is best played with the revised translation patch, so it doesn't matter whether you're using the US release or not. And, well, the Japanese version's cheaper. So if you have a way to play it with a patch, with a with a translation, a better translation than the one that we got for the physical release, take it. Thank 
you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>